Welcome back. You are with us on the CNBC TV 18 Investment Guide, and we are in conversation with Kuntal Shah of uh, Oakland Capital. Kuntal, now give us your magic, your recipe. I know you won't talk about stocks, but at least tell us about the style. You know, when it comes to picking, uh, you know, a potential multi-bagger, where do you begin? Uh, with the concept itself, the the business, an idea that's not been discovered, or do you look at the management first, or the balance sheet of the company first? What is sacrosanct for you, and how does one avoid getting stuck with mediocre uh, managements and mediocre companies? Hi, so should we, uh, uh, average investor has to concentrate his time because if one doesn't concentrate his thoughts, time, and efforts, so since the sheer number of opportunities available in the market are so large, one would suffer from decision fatigue, which will lead to bad decision making. So first. You got to have a framework which makes the opportunity set you examine and think about it on a day-to-day -day basis very small enough so that it has enough uh, potential on the upside but also narrow enough to allow you to get to know the upside and the downside scenario quite well. So the typically the process starts for me at least which works is that I try to take certain companies of certain scale and certain size and try to eliminate what I call fragility within the companies which I look at. Now what are the sources of the fragility? So if you look at it, any company which is highly leveraged doesn't have margin of error or safety on that side. Secondly, the company where incentives of the management are misaligned with the in incentives of the minority shareholder would have differential purpose and that is amply Born out in the way the PSUs are being governed. But having said that, once in a two decades, there always come a time then where we deliver a way on upside on the basis of the uh, the deep discount at which they are available at, and this could be one of the time as well. So one start like a uh, peeling off the all the sources of fragility. Any management which is engaging in a win lose situation would eventually not give you a compounded return over a long period of time and let me be more nuanced about that. First to win in the stock market, the management has to win with the customer market. Management has to also win the talent market. So the toxic culture are something which needs to be avoided. So there is a litany of checklist which with you filter down and arrive at opportunity set which gives you companies which are likely to give you a good favorable chance of a asymmetric payoff. Now it's very well known that there are only few ways companies can create value for the shareholders. One classic way is to increase the free cash flow generation which can be done by either lowering the interest cost, tax burden, increasing profit margin or asset turn or funding the asset cheaply. This DuPont formula is well known to almost all investors but there are many soft intangibles side about the art side of the finding the right investment processes which are not screenable. For example, management culture is not one, one such thing. The ability of manage to compete and respond to the changing customer preferences and technological innovation is something which you have to deeply think about. So it's, it's a twin tech process analysis where after having a meaningfully decent size of companies, you look at three aspects of the businesses. The business in itself, the management which is driving the business and most importantly your expectation and your reaction to the range of outcomes which are probabilistic in nature. Let's deep, deep dive in each of them. From business perspective obviously you are looking at businesses which are competitively advantaged especially in the times of dislocation that they tend to get market share and obviously they are riding on the back of a large mega trend or a tailwind which are enables to grow their top line at faster than the nominal GDP growth. If not, and yet they are cheap, then probably most of them will qualify in value traps, which is something you would want to invo uh, avoid for time value of m money and the compounding thereon. So you analyze the business from various vantage point of that of a customer, that of a regulator, that of a vendor, that, that of a competitor, and you try to find out what are the few those parameters which keep company in a very advantageous position. You would want to typically find, you would come across this kind of companies in sectors which don't have uh, uh, too much of capital intensity, are, uh, 
uh, having a very slow or negative working capital, have very high gross margins or very high asset turnovers and, and are typically uh, consolidating in nature where supply is probably shrinking faster than the demand. From the management view, view side, you want to partner with a management which is energetic, intelligent and ethically aligned to your value systems. You would want to have a management which is capable of reinventing and pivoting to the new changes which are likely to occur. You want to have a management which is good capital allocator because that's the single most decision which they can in control and hence mm -hmm. management which tend to do buybacks and reduce the number of outstanding share using cash flows which are real tend to create a lot of wealth. Also the management which is not driven by hubris and, and is not so obsessively focused on the market but is focused on the customer and has a day one mentality are likely to win. The most difficult part however is to control yourself and your own emotion. Uh, they say that uh, in uh, everything, uh, compounding works in long term, right? But in long term, we are all dead. And long term is series of short term, which you have to navigate. And hence, the most difficult part for an investor is every investor has had a lot of multi-baggers in their portfolio. But the question is, what was the capital they allocated to it? Okay. And how much time did they held for? Got, got the that. duration of the... Uh, holding period is the biggest Achilles heel of investors. Got that. Uh, holding period is important. Uh, now, you know, Kuntal, you referred to history as, uh, you know, something which perhaps doesn't get as much importance as it should. So let's talk about your historical lessons. What are the kind of challenges you have faced and the kind of mistakes you have made? If you could give us some examples and what were the learnings from them? So, uh, Anuj, uh, <laughs> Uh, experience, uh, I, I, I've learned at the uh, School of Hard Knocks and experience has taught me many things but she has also sent very terrific bills to me. Uh, when I sit back and analyze the kind of mistakes which have constantly been reoccurring, uh, I think so one, one big mistake which doesn't show up in my balance sheet is the acts of omission which is regarding to a lot of businesses whom I understood very well but I didn't have the courage to load it up or you know I waited for a favorable price and how I have overcome that that is more meaningful so what I do now is whenever I have 70 to 80 percent comfort with the investment proposition I at least initiate a small position and I know it's a mental accounting but this enables me to keep track of the company and and load it up as my cognizance of the company and the, and the business prospects unfold in time I think so this this process of averaging up has really helped me to overcome that mistake of uh, you know getting anchored to a stock price and not acting on it thorough. Mm. Second big mistake which is a recurring is you know premature selling. I have very high opportunity costs because we don't generate any additional capital. So what used to happen is you know when the stock used to become slightly expensive I used to rush to sell to buy something new without realizing the fact that as the company delivers and the company changes its orbit in terms of scale and profitability and size. Investors with much more lower threshold of acceptable returns come to buy it and make the stock liquid. The company gets included in indices, in FNO and all those technical things come over and they stay expensive for a long period of time. And how do I have I calibrated this learning? There is a narrow zone of buy zone for me which I f follow by first getting a small position and then loading it up. But there is a very wide range of hold zone now where I just don't do anything and try to just keep on uh, analyzing my investment hypothesis with a clear proviso that your ideas are meant to be stress tested as new information <coughs> comes in. They are not meant to be cherished. So you constantly seek out disconfirming evidence about the hypothesis which could render the original hypothesis wrong. This, I think so, is a constant exercise and helps you to stay anchored. And one thing, two things which really help me is maintaining a decision journal and doing a pre-mortem rather than post-mortem that what could kill this business or what could go wrong to make my situation as an investor unviable. So these are the two, le two mistakes um, which I personally have gone through multiple times over. However, there's a lot of learning from documented history. Uh, both greed, sure. fear and stupidities of human investors has been well documented. Oh yes, absolutely. Human emotions, I guess, is what it boils down to in the end, right? 
before we go, we, we do have to wind up now. Just about a minute left on the show, Kuntal. Uh, everybody wants to know your next big idea. And I know you can't take any names out here. But at least tell us what excites you in the market right now. You know, some themes, anything that you might be studying or analyzing at present. So I think so uh, in financial sector, the market share is moving towards the efficient with low cost of capital and distribution in place and technology in place. There are five, six names which will continue to do well because there's a long runway of market share to gain. I think so uh, supply side is consolidated also dramatically in one sector, which uh, I will leave a quiz with you that it's a sector which is almost 6% of India's GDP, but even under less than 1% of India's market cap and supports actually 260 industries and government has laid out huge amount of incentive to this is you are right. I'm referring to housing and construction and real estate. I think so you will have some clear emerging beginners out there. Pharma, IT and, and certain materials where supply constraints re remain and India has natural advantage in terms of manufacturing capability and know-how, I think so also would turn to, do, uh, to continue to do well given the situation. All right, Kuntal, we will leave it there today. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, good talking to you and uh, the thing which stood out with me, uh, Surabhi, is the importance of history, you know, in stock markets. And the reason for that is very simple. Stock market is about greed and fear, and greed and fear is something which hasn't changed for the last 100 years, will not change in the next 100 years, and that's why history plays a very important lesson in, you know, what markets do. Well, that's the big takeaway from this week's investment guide. Kuntal, thanks very much for joining in. We have to take your leave as well. We'll bring you more interesting themes in the coming weeks. Thank you for watching.